Welcome back, everyone. We're now starting the last session of the conference, Symmetric 2, with two talks. One talk that will be in person, the second talk online. First one is Know Thy Basis, Decomposing the Finite Fields of 64 Elements for Lightweight S-Box Implementation. And Sumanta Sakar will give the talk. Sumanta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nikki, for the introduction. Um, this is a joint work with my uh, co-authors, Dilip Shah, uh, Dhiman Shah, and Kalikinkar Mondol. And uh, Kalikinkar is here. Uh, the other two guys are back in India. Uh, maybe they're watching online. Uh, so as the title says, uh, this uh, decomposition, decomposing F to 6, the French phase for um, lighter is box. So actually, we have played around the uh, this uh, finite field F to six. So a um, little bit of introduction. Um, so the recent trend we we saw that there is a there's a rise of six bit as boxes. Um, so for example, um, um, well, so before the rise of S boxes, there was we saw the rise of uh, S boxes for four. Uh, dimension four, dimension five, and uh, excuse me, Ricky, uh, the timer is not. Yeah, just continue talking. Like they'll activate the timer. Go okay, ahead. yeah, thank you. Um, so, for example, when um, a lighter cryptography started, it uh, started uh, uh, with the uh, uh, research on four bit X boxes. We saw uh, various constructions of uh, four bit X boxes in the design, like present prints or or gift. Uh, then uh, more or less, four bit was a bit uh, saturated. Then we saw as boxes on uh, dimension five. Um, Ascon took the Ketchak S box and uh, modified it for the design. And then we saw also five bit S box being used in the uh, uh, AD in Psycon. Uh, then we all saw uh, some uh, constructions uh, or ciphers. Uh, like fights, beep beep, uh, speedy, they were uh, using uh, six bit S boxes. So uh, all these S boxes were part of uh, the design. So they are like there are some target of the ciphers, and those S boxes were designed to meet those targets. Um, we also have seen uh, independent studies on um, six bit X boxes. Uh, which are rather extreme. For example, 6-bit APN, uh, which solved uh, the big APN problem on dimension 6, uh, solved by Dillon. Um, and we name SMS-19 because we three co-authors of the same paper. We also did some work on 6-bit Xboxes uh, with some extreme properties, which were uh, like uh, non-trivial branch numbers. So. Trivial branch numbers mean that when the branch number is two, so differential input one and output one is, so that's very easy to construct. But moment you think of uh, branch number more than two, that's not trivial. So we call um, branch number non-trivial when it's more than two. So we had some construction on six bit X boxes. So yeah, there is a uh, growing interest in six bit S boxes. That's what I've been trying to uh, say in, uh, in the last uh, couple of minutes. So we have some uh, demand for a six bit X boxes. So there is a need for research on six bit X boxes. But so what about their uh, hardware implementation? What about their lightweight hardware implementation? So in this paper, we try to answer this question. Uh, so to do that, we transpose uh, the problem into finite field. So once we land into the finite field, there is several uh, flexibility that we have. We can represent the functions uh, with inferior uh, uh, polynomials, and we can see those functions. We can write with pen and paper. So that's a lot of advantage. Uh, so uh, to, to further study their behavior uh, for, uh, for the implementation, what we did, um, we um, did a detailed decomposition of, of the finite field F to six. And then we investigated a lot of representations. And, um, and then uh, we studied each of those representations and what would be their impact in the 
implementation. So a little bit of uh, background in uh, uh, in his box, if you are not aware of. So his box is basically, uh, if you see, uh, it says a permutation that takes as uh, n bit input to uh, n bit output, and you can um, write this sort of function with uh, uh, n um, uh, boolean functions. So when you bunch them up together, you can call them as a vectorial boolean function. So there's another name for uh, uh, its boxes, and then you have uh, these uh, each functions, these boolean functions called a quotient function. When you combine them together uh, with linear combinations, they're called um, component function. Uh, you you alternatively uh, you can move from vector space to the finite field and then you can define as boxes. Then it's simply a permutation of uh, of the field um, f to n. Uh, so I've been talking a lot of uh, time uh, decomposition. So decomposition of what? So what is the composite thing here? So we we see a, a field uh, which is uh, raised two times. So suppose we have a field construction. First you raise uh, two to the a, and then you raise another uh, degree b. So then you get um, a composite field. So so you could have done uh, this field construction directly from f to f to uh, to the power a times b. So so this is this is we we call this this type of function. So when n is a composite number, so then f to n is a composite field. Um, so this is and when you have you have two ways to construct uh, these fields. And note that these two are isomorphic. So essentially, they are the same up to isomorphism. Uh, and uh, so when we talk about s boxes, we also talk about affine equivalence s boxes. So two S boxes, S and S prime, are affine equivalence. If you can get S prime from S by uh, transforming um, uh, with the input with a linear transformation, and also uh, you can also apply another uh, uh, linear transformation on the output. If you get the same, uh, if you get the S prime, then S and S prime are the same. So why this affine uh, equivalence is important because. Uh, when you construct a new S box, you must check whether it is new. So it's 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 not um, it's not uh, a something like already known uh, S box. Uh, it is equivalent to. So there are some certain uh, crypto properties which are invariant uh, in uh, in these classes. For example, differential uniformity and nonlinearity for every F and equivalent S boxes they are the same. However, there are some cryptographic properties which are not um, invariant in these classes, for example, branch numbers. So linear branch number, um, differential branch number, they are not really um, invariant. So, so with this background, I move to the main work uh, that what we did. Uh, so let's talk about this uh, decomposition now. So it's F to six. So C B X box. Now we have transposed this problem to the final field F to six. Uh, so, so the first thing that would come to mind is uh, you construct f to six from f two. So you take a six degree extension and you get f to six. Alternatively, you can take another route. So you first move to the first level, which is f to three, with a three degree extension, and then once you are there. So f to three to take another two degree extension, it will reach f to three uh, uh, raised two. So from f to three to f to three raised two, we got uh, eighteen primitive polynomials that we write just wrote there y square gamma zero y plus uh, gamma one. So we got eighteen options for primitive polynomials. Um, we got another uh, option. We can go in another way, which is you raise uh, to f to square with a two degree primitive polynomial. So from f to square, you can go to f to square cube. Uh, from f to square to f to square, you got you you need one three degree polynomial, a primitive polynomial, 
And uh, that's why we mentioned there. So y cube plus delta zero, y square plus delta one, uh, y plus delta two. There we got 12 such primitive polynomials. Um, as I mentioned, these three fields are all isomorphic. So f to three square, f to six, and f to square cube, they are all isomorphic. Um, and there are six such isomers. So for example, so ultimately you have to reach to f to six, right? So, so from f to cube to square, you've got six isomorphism that you can go there with. And from um, f to square to cube to f to six, you get six uh, isomorphism and vice versa. Um, so uh, it's, um, it's not the whole story yet because we need to choose basis. But if you fix the basis, um, so if you take the first root, then you have uh, 18 primitive polynomials and six isomorphisms. So that means you've got 108 representations for f to six. Uh, if you go down the line, uh, you've got 72 uh, representations for um, for f to six. So now we need to choose bases. There are hundreds of bases. What to choose from? So essentially, there are some classes of bases. For example, polynomial bases and normal bases. So you can choose one of them, or or rather, we have we have we have treated with uh, respect to polynomial bases and normal bases. While studying this, we found some interesting class of bases which have very nice properties uh, that we call uh, spatial normal bases. So what is uh, spatial normal bases? So um, suppose you are taking the upper root, the, the black arrow. Um, so when uh, you are taking that root, then you uh, need to choose a basis over f to cube square. And suppose that basis gamma on gamma two, they are coming from the other subfield. So you have taken the root through f to cube to f to cube square, but you are taking the basis element from the other subfield, which is f to square. So when we do that, so then we see that this gamma one and gamma two, they, they form a normal basis. Um, any power of uh, gamma one is a linear combination of this gamma one and gamma two. And, and now you have to implement an element, a theta of this final field. And then uh, if, you, if you have represented in this way, so if you take theta and then you raise the power theta, then you see that all terms will be like linear combinations of gamma and gamma two. Uh, there is no powers of gamma one and gamma two. They're all linear. And surprisingly, um, there is no constant term that has come from uh, delta uh, lambda zero and uh, lambda one. So they, they vanish. So this happens when we take the black root, the, the topmost root. Uh, similar things happen if we take the lower root, which is the red one. Um, so we're going through the subfield f to square, and we reach f to square cube, and then we we take the basis, which is now coming from the other subfield f to cube. The same thing will happen that beta one, beta two, beta cube they are the basis element, and then same results happen that any power of beta one is uh, uh, is a linear combination of this beta one, beta two, beta three. And if you consider a generic element theta, you raise the power theta d, and then you will see that there is no uh, higher power of beta one, beta two, except one, and there is no dependencies on delta zero, delta one, delta two. So what does it give? Why this special to us? So this is, um, so we see, so those, those, those delta zero or gamma zero, whatever, they, they vanish. So what does it mean that there's no scalar multiplication? And we got very compact expression. Um, so that means 
they reduce the other uh, field operations like addition, multiplication, expansion. We got very less such operations. That means uh, we can really expect an efficient hardware implementation if we consider it this way, the implementation in this way. So the implication is normal, this special normal basis is really uh, hardware friendly. So now it's time to choose basis. We have chosen the polynomials. Now I have to choose the basis. Um, so as I say, there are so many options for basis, but we just stick to three options, polynomial basis, normal basis, and spatial normal basis. So for the uh, first um, option, which is the, which is the uh, topmost route, uh, first we choose the three degree extension along with uh, polynomial basis. And then next um, extension, we choose uh, another polynomial basis. So that's the PP. And you see the subscript three and superscript two, two. That means that we are going through that route F to three and then means three degree and then two degree. So this is the convention that we have used. So if you, when we are considering uh, the other route uh, through F to square, so we, we it's the same thing we did is like we chose uh, first P and then P. So that PP. So similarly, uh, we also have chosen uh, first for the top layer, for the, uh, for the top uh, transition, we chose first P and then N. And, and for the lower one, we for also the, did the same thing, uh, polynomial and then normal. Well, we have only option to choose spatial normal basis in case of the higher extension. For example, when f to three to f to three to two, or f to square to f to square three. So, uh, what I did is we chose first polynomial basis and then special normal basis in both these cases. Um, so, similarly, we have. I'm just skipping this. Uh, we got total uh, twelve options. Uh, for the first route, we got six options uh, for basis, and uh, for the uh, lower path, we got six uh, more options. So with all this representation ready, uh, we went for the implementation, and we see what sort of uh, what we thought, we, what we uh, found in the analysis. Does it help or not? So uh, to do that, uh, we chose a very special function that I mentioned in the background, SMS 19, which gave. Uh, uh, three uh, differential branch number and uh, differential branch number three. So these functions were, had very specific uh, structure, which looked like, uh, which is of the form lambda x to the power d plus mu x. So already it's got only two terms. Either it is x to the d or added with some linear term. So it exploits basically the relation between resilience uh, Boolean function and the linear branch number. Uh, and so with this, we uh, revisited the same algorithm and we first constructed the uh, S-boxes with three linear branch number, and then we dig into the affine equivalent S-boxes as these are not invariant, the branch number is not invariant. So finally, we got three differential branch number, and these functions also have very good other crypto properties. So by the affine equivalence, they don't really hamper those uh, affine, uh, those, those uh, crypto properties. So what change we made in the uh, in while we're revisiting is that we particularly choose very sparse matrix A, which are in linear algebra is called type three matrix, which has got which is a binary matrix. It has got all one in the diagonal x and uh, one in another place. The rest are zeros. So we had in mind to make it lightweight, so we chose such a uh, sparse matrix. Uh, so after so this SMS nineteen actually showed that you could construct uh, S-boxes with such property, but re really didn't explore. So, but we did, and we chose two degree and three degree, and we got 18 S-boxes uh, with good crypto properties and along with branch number three. Um, so then we have all these representations and we have all these choices of basis, 
together with we tested for all these 18 S boxes. So uh, in total, 19,440 representations we have tried. And we also tried additionally the inverse function and the uh, degree four. And also we uh, not only compared them with the lightweight that uh, design we had, uh, also com uh, compared with them uh, LUT and NF. Uh, so in total, we considered 19,912. Uh, as boxes. So we use tools, uh, Cadence synthesis tool with 65 nanometer UMC library, and we reported the lowest area function. And we got our representation really gave us light, uh, um, lighter implementation than this um, ANF and uh, loot. And uh, for spatial normal basis, we either got the lightest one or next to the lightest. So what we saw in theory is actually was validated by the tool. So um, yeah, we are at the end of this talk. And so um, we have analyzed uh, these six bit X boxes and how this field decomposition helps in lightweight design. And then um, we think that these S boxes could be used in Cypher also. You, you, uh, if you want, you can uh, try them out. And uh, we ons only tried power functions, like x to the power d. We didn't try other functions, but I think the, this could be tried there as well. Um, so if you're interested, you can check our paper. And I thank you for your attention. Please, uh, uh, I welcome your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samantha. We have a few minutes for questions. I'll start with an easy question. <laughs> Do you have a favorite six bit S box? Yes. Uh, X, uh, X cube. X so cube, okay. It's very lightweight <laughs> by nature. So is, is this equal to one of the um, uh, yeah. S boxes in the designs? Yeah, yeah, you'll find yeah. it. Yeah. So I, I'm not too familiar with uh, SMS. Like, are, are they using this uh, S box as well in site or? In Cypher? Oh. Which S box is SMS using? Oh, X. So you find X to the five, X to the power ten. Uh, uh -huh. So those are the if you if go to that list. Yeah, uh, yeah. those are the uh, SMS boxes. Okay, but yeah. not not containing your favorite one. That's what you're saying. Yeah, we, we modified them. So you modified them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I have also a few questions about the um, uh, hardware implementations, but I don't know if that's the part you were involved in yourself. Or... Yeah, so I'm not part of the implementation, okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm not the good person to say. So, um, but I can convey the question. So, oh well, I mean, my question was because I see you using this uh, 65 um, nanometer um, standard cell library. Like, have you considered other uh, technologies as well? Like maybe smaller. Um... Okay, so that's a good question. So actually, we did not. So we didn't have any access to other libraries. But I suppose because of the nature of these spaces, I suppose they will do the same trick over there. Uh, so by nature, it is, it's quite lightweight. So, uh, but given a chance, we certainly would like to try uh, other cell libraries. And the results might be a bit different, right? It might or, be a yeah. bit different, but you may get some sort of similar results. No questions from the audience so far? Um... Okay, so I'll round up with a, a last question then. Like, I mean, it's interesting to look at the implementation of an S box. I'm trying to see if you've estimated what the impact would be on implementing um, the entire cipher using your. Um, yeah, that's a very box. good question. Actually, we, we haven't thought about this. Um, so if you think so, then you have to chop into F to six actually. So everything so everything should be on F to six. So stick know, bit, stick bit, stick bit. How big is the savings of doing an improved S box implementation on the cipher? So if you apply this S box, yeah, yeah. So if you apply, so you we don't have. Uh, if you well, so if you consider beep beep or those things, you are trying to say that, right? So with respect to them, so the problem here is those S boxes were based on ANF, and when we tried them. To compare, so then the 
problem was that we have to apply Lagrange interpolation or something like that to get the finite field definition. And then they were very big. And really, they don't work for our algorithm. So our algorithm will work when your S box is has some uh, short compact representation. Uh, so then we are not able to compare if we switch those beep beep or the other S boxes and we replace R. So actually, they are not comparable in that sense. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thanks, Samantha again. Okay. Thank you very much. That brings us to the last talk of the session and also the last talk of the conference. And this is an online talk. So I believe we have a video loaded that we can play. I'll give you the title. It is uh, Krisa X, Unleashing Performance Excellence in Lightweight Symmetric Cryptography for Extendable and Deeply Embedded Processors. Thank you for the introduction. I'm glad to have the opportunity to share our work with you. The primary goal of our work is to significantly enhance operational efficiency of lightweight cryptography software on commodity and low-cost device while keeping things generic. This work was made possible through a fruitful collaboration with Dr. Itamar Levy from bar -Ilan University. But first, let's take a look at, at lightweight cryptography. Back to 2018, the folks at NIST decided it was time to come up with a more efficient symmetric cryptography that works well on the smaller or weaker devices, not just on big powerful computers. That's because small gadgets like sensors or smart devices might struggle with the heavy duty cryptography. They moved forward and by mid 2023, they picked ASCON as the standard for this easier to handle cryptography. This is a big deal because starting 2024, People making those device applications will start using ASCON to ensure everything runs smoothly without, without taking too much power or space. Certainly, this is matter for everyday gadgets, especially things like sensors and Internet of Things. If the gadgets talk to each other continuously, this can be done faster and without using a lot of power. Everything will work better. To break it down, using light, lightweight cryptography means that things work faster because the code runs quicker. The device does not require a large instruction memory, which is great because memory takes up space and costs money. And the overall solution uses less power, so your battery lasts longer. And with that, we, we have the incentive for a lightweight cryptography in a nutshell. So the, the primary goal of our work is to significantly enhance the ex execution efficiency of AWC software by a factor of X. Our target is a variety of AWC primitives while ensuring minimal hardware overhead on a low end risk architecture. Edge application designer always wants the software application to be flexible. This means they can run various AWC algorithms and should run with high performance, low latency, and low power cost. The efficiency of AWC algorithm is heavily influenced by the processor architecture and the instruction set used for its implementation. Our idea is to customize the hardware tightly coupled with the new instruction. This applies collectively to a various AWC algorithm in a way that it will increase parallelism, instruction, data, and memory parallelism. The research and the exploration we are presenting today began during the AWC selection process between the second to the third phase. We found it interesting to explore how we can jointly improve execution efficiency across various AWC algorithms and we believe that researchers in this field might find it interesting to explore the following question. For example, how we can achieve higher performance by customizing hardware and instruction set extensions for various AWC standards? What is the trade-off between jointly accelerating instruction set extension for various primitive versus independently optimizing them? And what are the general principle, principles for effective crypto sense instructions? In the last 15 years, some very interesting work has been done making cryptography algorithms run faster on processors. A lot of the focus has been making things more efficient to a software hardware tweaks and by extending the instruction set. Also, customizing instruction sets, especially for cryptography algorithms, has become quite popular for generic purpose processors. However, dedicated instructions for symmetric encryption are just beginning to emerge. For example, Various instruction sets such as ARM x86 and RISC-V support commonly used cryptography standards like AES and SHA. 
One recent study presented at CHESS 2023 by Ching and his team show how each LWC received its own ISE, executed on standard RISC-5 processor. In our work, we made progress by incorporating processor hardware extension with custom instruction, particularly for LWC. We have classified this extension based on the hardware area and performance. We propose single instruction design that aim to optimize LWC algorithm jointly. Our design is followed by quantitative performance analysis, which demonstrates significant advancements, advancement of our traditional method. A few strategies are presented here for achieving high performance processing for applications like AWC running on edge processing. Option A presents a software-only implementation that is very flexible and can be adopted for more than one LWC algorithm. However, because the number of base instructions for typically RISC processor is limited, we get low performance, especially when running algorithms that involve many bitwise operations in loops, which is typically appear in various AWC kernel or permutation. On the other hand, loosely coupled hardware acceleration, RTL block, are, as illustrated in option B, can bring superior performance, but hardware RTL is fixed and not modular, cost a significant amount of space and consume power. The alternative approach is to use an ex expandable processor in which the processor hardware is extended to execute things in parallel. This can be done expanding the data path, adding extra ALU, extending the registry file and local memory, and much more than that. Our research relay on this approach to extend the processor with additional hardware and expand the processor instruction set to support more advanced ALU operation. Our playground, describing options C and D, focus on both hardware extension and either extension, along with optimizing the software layer to utilize the new hardware. So now let's examine the finalists for the LWC, as outlined in the following table. We have one algorithm based on stream cipher, two algorithms based on block ciphers, and the rest are permutation or sponge-oriented designs. We have evaluated the acceleration for all LWC finalist lists, targeting the AEAT part of the algorithm. We focus on the, kernel, on the kernel of each algorithm, which is the high computation part of the code. For each algorithm, we use the benchmark code, the 32-bit version code, usually written in C or C++, that is taken from the NIST LWC repository and used to evaluate the software performance. The experimental framework used in this study is a 32-bit RISC five-stage processor capable of modular extensibility under an academic license. This processor framework enables us to extend the processor in various vectors. We can expand the registry file by adding more processor register in different lands. We can have wider instruction bus, which will enable us to fetch more than one instruction in cycle. This actually enables us to build a multi-issue machine. We can have a wider data bus this extension enables to bring wider data chunk for memory. Yes, so not just wider bus, but also more than one load store unit, enabling us a parallel uh, memory fetch, which helps significantly reduce memory bottleneck. On top of that, we can add more parallel execution units. We can also add dedicated memory space, like local constant and state, which help us to reduce pipeline stores. This framework also enables us to create custom instruction to complete the architecture enhancement and utilize the hardware extension better. Those custom instructions, such as reuse operation, where we combine multiply simple operation into a single instruction, or a simple operation, where, where we parallel processing of multiply data element with a single instruction. So now let's uh, focus on the main part of our project, introducing Risa X. Quiza X is a set of custom instructions created to speed up LWC on extendable processors. The Quiza X instructions are split into two main groups, algorithm agnostic and algorithm specific. We then categorize the instruction based on their computation complexity. We have a low hardware complexity instruction called generic atomic, which involves combination of a bitwise operation. Then there are higher complexity instruction called specific block, designed for extensive computation, and they are served as a building block component for composing cryptography permutation code. Finally, the highest level of complexity is called a specific procedure, 
which cover the entire permutation and establish the optimized subset to maximize acceleration, clearly trade-off of area. Each instruction from every category is designed consider considering the trade-off among performance, area, and code size. Then a new instruction is mapped to the C intrinsic and incorporated with, L with the LWC code. This involve of involve in a code optimization that use to use the new instruction operation efficiency. Efficiently. So one of our motivation in this research is to investigate opportunity where new instruction and associate hardware can be shared among other AWC algorithms. To demonstrate that, let's examine the Keshek permutation. This permutation is used by both Zodiac and Elephant version of LWC. More than that, Ketchak F permutation is fundamental building block for SHA-3 and for two candidates in the Caesar computation called, uh, namely Kiak and Tijai. Looking over the prim primitive, primitive uh, on how permutation function is compute, it seems that it utilizes 25 Ketchak states labeled from A0 all the way to A24. Each of these states hold eight bytes and one through the computation eight rounds are carried out. Diving deeper into the mechanism, it's clearly that we can map out few special instructions previously named as GA, SB, and SP. With the GA type, what we are looking at is a sort of blend operation that's pretty popular across various algorithms. Indeed, instructions also pop up in ASCON, GIFT, and other LWC. Now, when we talk about specific block, this instruction composed more computation like Appen in each at, in each one of the Ketchak steps, like theta, rho, uh, uh, pi, and iota. Then there is the specific procedure, which executes the entire Ketchak permutation round process in one execution, either a single or multi-pipeline stage incorporated in the data bit. Quiza X design methodology flow is not just for the instruction. It also involves processor extension. We have kicked off our design process by focusing on the most optimized version of LWC code formatted in a 32-bit code. We have pairing this with a straightforward RISC 32-bit processor that stick to the base either. The first thing we do is dive deep into the LWC to pinpoint where the heavy lifting happens in terms of computation among with understanding the code structures and function. So it's like a detective work which dig through profiling data to find out where the program is spent most of the time. When I talk about analyzing the structure of the code, I'm basically looking on the skeleton. At this stage, we are more interested in the forms. Uh, this might involve tracing the flow of the algorithm, pinpointing the loops, conditions, and where decisions split uh, the path of execution. It's also about seeing how data is stored around and when memory access happens. Then, we shift gear to focus on the functionality, the real meat of that matter. What exactly is the algorithm up to? How does it crunch those latency numbers? This part is about understanding the compiler turn our high-level instruction into processor language, the either instruction, and finding where real either work hours of the code are happening. In the next phase, we will focus on designing the custom instruction. These days involve of diving deep into coding and creating a hardware structure necessary to fulfill the computation required using a HDL language. The following is reconstruct the processor with adding hardware extensions such as more registry buses and local memory, etc. To finalize the design process, we continue continuously iterate by evaluating and refining the design to ensure both high performance and low latency. This iteration includes an important optimization phase during which we adapt the original code to better leverage the capability of a new ISA. This phase includes update both the application code and the tool chain to fully support the new ISA. As a result of this design flow, we end up with a systematically designed process that results in addition, additional and optimized instruction set extension and hardware extension. So let's break down the Quiza X instruction set by algorithm. Basically, under the category of generic atomic and specific block, we have got instructions that overlap across different algorithms. 
And you will notice they are marked with the same color to show that. Now, diving into the numbers, we are looking at 32 instructions under generic atomic, 22 under specific block, and then there are these 10 specific procedural instructions. The things about this specific procedural instruction is that they are tailored to individual algorithm. It is like each one, each one has its own unique set of moves, and uh, we have covered all the possible variations specific for each algorithm. Digging into ASCON and Quiza X. So ASCON is the finalist of this computation, and here we give it a close attention. ASCON uses a method where it applies round transformation to 320 bit states going through three states, adding constant, swapping bit in substitution layer, and then mixing it up in a linear layer. The 320 bit states are divided into 10 words, each 32 bit, split in an interleaved way for odd and even. So the adding constant phase involved so these two data inputs, which require two base instructions, not counting the instruction required for loading and storing the data back to memory. In the linear section, an intermediate value goes through the bitwise not operation and then bitwise end operation. The result is then stored to obtain the final value, which takes three base instructions. In the linear phase, data is rotated 32 bit input by performing a circular shift, followed by storing the result to obtain the final value. This operation compromises two basic instructions. For the ASCON scenario, the G element highlighted in blue are actually fused of a series of bitwise operations executed in a single cycle. The SB instruction in green tackles each layer as a single instruction, while the SP instruction in orange color navigates through the entirety of the ASCON permutation. So to really pump up the ILP, DLP, and MLP, we have decked out the processor with wider buses adding a multi-issue hardware, doubling down the load store unit, and extending the registry file. All these processor extensions mean that we can run GA instruction in parallel, as described in the processor's block list here in this slide. This approach for a multi-issue instruction set extension and doubling access to the memory give us a significant performance boost. Let's take another close look at ASCON, this time from coding perspective. We began by optimizing the ASCON native code implementation, initially using 104 instructions. By introducing GA instruction into the mix, we managed to bring that number down to 37, which speed up the computation by a factor of five. If we go and use SB instruction and optimize the code further, we were able to reduce the instruction count even further down to just three ALU custom instruction, increasing speed up by a factor of eight. When we use the SP instruction for ASCON, we utilize the single instruction to perform the entire permutation in a single round. This move alone boosts performance by 10x speed up. In this slide, we are diving into the latency result obtained from utilizing 16 byte, 16 -byte uh, plain text and associated data. It will show us how the integration of processor extension and instruction set extension significantly enhance AWC performance latency. The bar chart on the slide clearly demonstrates the performance uplift achieved by Quiza X, setting a clear contrast against our baseline. This baseline, for context, is derived from the optimized 32-bit version of the code found in NIST repository, executed on the processor with no extension at all. By using the generic instruction achieving uh, between 2x to 5x speed up, where the specific block gives us between 4x to 8x speed up, while the specific procedure instruction brings up between 7 to 70x speed up. For algorithms that are more hardware oriented, like Elephant, Python, or Sparkle, creating a significant parallelism is more doable, and we can be recognized with the larger speed up factor, as it can see from the bar chart. In this slide, I will describe the impact of various features of the outdoor, in the outdoor, on the outdoor cost, measured by the number of uh, lookup table, LUTs, on the FPGA. Starting with our baseline processor, it, come out, it comes in a, at around 3,500 LUT. So after we introduced the GA instruction set, we saw the size increase about 12.6%. Uh, touching the overall of 4K LUT. 
Then we have got the SB unit, uh, the SB instruction. These are heavily weight computation block. They push the processor area up by a bit, more than 30%, depending largely on the specific uh, instruction. The SP instruction, the specific procedure, are even higher in terms of computation power. Uh, they are packed with more registry and more wire and more computation. And in uh, this, we have looked at bump the processor up to 40%. It is a significantly increased, but for the performance boost, it can be well worth it. You can also know that the GA instruction may be well fitted to accelerate various other application space, not just LWC. So for benchmarking our Quiza X processor against other instruction set, we want to see how it stack up and it's showing impressive performance. The chart in this slide presents the cycle count across a list of processors. In a green bar, you can see the Quiza X, while the other processor marks in other colors. Our goal here is uh, have been uh, to match our testing condition with those reporting by other particularly focus on scenario with 16 bytes of plain text or data. Unlike other processors that stick to base either or adopt generic approach for crypto scalar instruction set, our approach especially target LWC across the board and to ensure we are on a level uh, playing field, we have added a few hardware extension of our own, like a multi-issue extension, which is notable wrap up our speed up. However, I should mention that this speed gain does come with a trade-off in terms of processor physical area. But comparing this aspect is a bit tricky since the other reports didn't provide such data for comparison. At last, to summarize our work, leveraging our processor extension and instruction set extension allow us to enhance our computation speed up significantly. Our Quiza X instruction set is designed to offer variety of speed up opportunity tailored to the platform solution needed and the area cost. For the simpler generic atomic instruction, found their work exceptionally well with a broad area of LWC algorithm presenting a low cost option for speed enhancement. We also found that for hardware oriented LWC implementation, the potential for speed up has become even more pronounced by parallelism at the algorithm level and maximizing a hardware extension, we reached significant performance gain. Quiza X instruction set enabled constant time execution, reducing memory footprint. This feature highlights the value of instruction set extension in re re resource constrained devices targeting LWT, LWC primitive. Last, the source code of this work is available on the public GitHub. And if you have idea or proposal, please get in touch with us. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ganon. So that brings us to the end of the last session. I would like to thank all the speakers of the session and um, also all of you for making it until the very end. Please stay into the room because we're now moving to closing remarks. Thank you, everyone. By the way, I do not see the speakers in the Zoom room, so that's why we're taking questions offline.
can take over the shift here. <laughs> So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, like this is uh, the end of the program, and uh, and before we uh, adjourn, and um, I thank everybody here for sticking it out to the very end. Of course, we thank uh, the people who have to leave as well, but uh, um, thank you. Um, without you guys, uh, this would not have been the success that Chess uh, 2024 would have been. <clears throat> now we will hand this over to the general chairs. Thank you very much. It has been a great uh, Chess 2024. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. I started to think of who all we thank, but it becomes impossible when you're like, well, who compiled the source code online? Who did the website? Um, so I, I think we just say thank you to everyone, except the Canadian visa processing people. So we do not thank them. The venue, the support staff, um, it's been an amazing experience. And I think, yeah, we turn it over to Benedict for special announcements. But we do have, because he's he makes all the awards, so he never gets anything. So we have a little chocolate lobster to bring back to the kids so they can also enjoy lobster and you can tell them it's good Canadian chocolate. <laughs> but honestly, uh, if, if I can say quick, um, you know, it's been at least 10 years since we have been sponsoring Chez and been part of the community, but our company exists because of the support from all of you so yeah we're here because of you and and it's really been an honor and a privilege to host and yeah and thank you to the previous chairs and yeah with all the support that they gave us because it was not possible without them so thank you you guys are all amazing and we're very privileged so thank you all right so now my slides please so that's like the end of uh, 2024. Um, yeah, before before closing completely. So I, I'll do what I did uh, last year as well, because uh, apparently this is not clear to everybody. So, you know, as Bart already said in the invited talk, this is all volunteer stuff. And so, of course, you know, Chess is doing something for you. You can publish your papers. You can go to great conferences and stuff. But maybe sometimes it's also good to think about, like, what, what can I do in return? Or how can I get engaged if I want to, and apparently not everybody knows this, so I just want to quickly walk you through the options. So first of all, as uh, Svetla mentioned during the Test of Time Award ceremony, um, this, this this whole Test of Time Award thing needs nominations, right? So if, 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 if you feel like uh, for the next year, uh, from the period of 2004, 5, 6, 
there's this one paper that I don't know changed my PhD or changed my life or I think this this is one of these breakthrough things. It just takes you one quick email to nominate that paper, and it helps the people who have to yeah make the selection at the end of the day. It helps them a lot to get a lot of input. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, kind of important. Uh, the next thing is uh, uh, that uh, a lot of let's say the, the the bigger decisions at at chess are um, taken by the steering committee. The steering committee currently has 12 members and, and six observing members. Um, and every year, two of these positions like expire and open up and new people can be uh, uh, elected in. So again, here, like if, if you feel like, yes, I want to be part of that, I mean, it's volunteer, you don't get money, you don't get a free chess registration, you get nothing for it, but um, you can influence things a little bit. You can look behind the scenes, what's happening. So uh, uh, nominate yourself, or if you say that that person does great community work, I think that person should be part of the club, nominate the person and we'll just volunteer them in whether they want or not. Yeah, so there's uh, there's stuff to do. Um, and of course, the, uh, what's also important is always, you know, to, um, to, to make proposals for, yes, I want to host the next one. I want to host the next one. I want to host the next one. So um, I'm now opening the call for hosting chess 27 in the Americas, so three years from now. Um, proposals are always due two years in advance. So mid-August 25, we are happy to receive proposals for hosting chess uh, 27 in the Americas. And that's all from me. Thanks very much. And with that, you can clap if you want. Otherwise, um, there's somebody here who wants to invite you for the next chess. Can we change slides? Can we change slides? One thing. Just this forward back. Can we change slides? Thanks. Take one in the green. I think it should. No, yes. Right. Uh... Welcome everyone. So my name is Reza. So I'm here to welcome everyone to next year's edition of Chess, which will be in Kuala Lumpur or KL as the local calls it. So it'll be uh, held from 14 until the 18th of September next year. So you might uh, be wondering where Malaysia is. So you are there and Kuala Lumpur KL is way over there. So if I can come here after 28 hours, you can too. <laughs> okay, so if you zoom in, so this is Malaysia. So that's KL over there. So there are many flights to uh, KL uh, and also to our more popular neighbor, Singapore. So, uh, but if you are fancy flying with Malaysia Airlines, we have a special deal with them. So you can get a special discount. And once you have arrived in the airport, we also have a partner with the KLI Express, which will take you direct to KL in under half an hour. Okay, so this is the location of the conference. It will be at the KL Convention Center. So we'll be using the east wing of this center. So for a sneak peek of how it will look like, so this is, we will be using this uh, wing. So if you can see, you can see the Twin Towers uh, from the venue. So it's a nice place. And also there's a huge park in front of it. And another reason you should come to KL is the food. Okay, so this is just a sample. So if you want to know more, sample more, please come to KL. Uh, so what about weather? Okay, so... Malaysia is located near the equator, so uh, temperatures around 21 to 32 degrees Celsius. So uh, that symbol summarizes the weather in Malaysia. So it can be sunny, uh, cloudy, and raining at uh, the same day. Okay. So we look forward to welcome everyone at chess, and thank you very much. The meeting is now officially adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>